out of distraction. Right? When you allow yourself to spend some time, quality time in silence, you know, even when you're eating, like, you know, this is a good exercise to do, and like, I know a lot of you, like, during the break, you go out and get food, and so like, you know, is that you eat in silence. Most of us are even somewhere. We're doing something else, like we're on our computer or we're watching television or we're talking to somebody or we're eating as we walk down the street. <laughs> right? Like we are just in constant motion all the time. So when I asked you that question earlier, are you stressed? All of you should say, yes, I am, actually, because all of those things that you're doing are stressing you out, whether you're conscious of it or not conscious of it. And it will eventually catch up to you. A lot of you are very young in here, you know? And so, like, you know, you might not be feeling the effects of that now, but cumulatively over time, you may body may start to actually break down if you don't already have a mental breakdown, right? Like, that's what will start to occur. So it's, re it's hugely vital for us to take space and time during the course of our day to actually shut off. Shut off and shut down and be still and be silent. And get rid of all the distraction that's there. Um, because then when you come out of that space of being still and being silent, you're much more present, you're much more aware. The words that you choose to speak become much more purposeful and intentional and, intentional and present. And then, how was it not having eye contact? Was that weird? Was that hard? Some of you, some of you, some of you, some of you, hard. But can you see how, how, how distracted we are just even through our vision? Right? Because our senses, which are really important, are on overload. We're overstimulated through our sensory system. So when we're overstimulated through the sensory system, we can't meditate. We, first of all, we can't even concentrate. We can't, there's no way you can meditate. And chances of you going beyond that are probably really minimal. So like, those are the steps, right? In the, in the sutras, he maps out for you these eight limbs. And before you can even begin to concentrate, you, the, there's something called pratyahara that I mentioned earlier. If you read, started to read about that in the sutras, it means withdrawal of the senses. So how do you do that? How do you withdraw your senses? How do you withdraw your senses is by stopping overstimulating your senses. <laughs> like doing that small little exercise that I had you do. Or when you do a restorative practice, you put an eye bat or you know, wrap your head or something where you're actually, and it may actually require you to physically block your senses. <coughs> bless you. Yes. Um, <coughs> bless you. Right. And we all get these allergies and things like that too, right? Which is just an over buildup of stress and toxicity. I'm not sure that or right or wrong. It's just this is what your environment has to actually. And so it's probably even more important now that we learn how to do some of these practices than it ever was before. You know, um, we're living in a very different time. And most of you in this room live also in a, a city. And with city living comes more stress. 
not less stress, more stress. You all chose to live here, right? <laughs> right, right. So you have to ask yourself that question. Well, you know. So you have less. You. you have an even greater responsibility to yourself to slow down. <coughs> Um, okay. Chrissy talked about the nervous system with you. Yeah? Okay. So what do you remember? Talk about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Chrissy? With you? Yes. Yes? Okay. What do you remember? What, what is the sympathetic nervous system? Fight or flight. Fight or flight. Okay. So what does that mean? Your body is in a chronic state of overload, okay? Which is where many of you are, even though you don't know it. Many of you, many of you are operating via your sympathetic nervous system. This part of the nervous system is really important because it is the part of the nervous system that um, makes you react to really dangerous situations. Right? So what would be a really dangerous situation that you would your nervous that you would want your nervous system to kick in and react to? Car. <laughs> right, okay, a car. A car. A car, like you step out into the street, car is coming or a bus is coming, and you better hope that your nervous system kicks in and gets you out of the way. Okay? When that happens, what what occurs internally when that happens? Your blood pressure goes up, right? Your adrenals, like the, the, the you're, you're like in a sort of like an overload of stimulation to your system. Okay, and other things like what happens is that the blood in your body now goes from the um, you know uh, the um, for example like the, the the blood that's like you know in and around the organs, the small intestine, kidney, things like that. It now goes from there out to the extremities, okay? So what's happening when you're in a really traumatic, stressful situation like that, you have to react really quickly. Your body builds up its endurance through that built-in system and basically pulls all of your energy to your extremities so that you can hightail it out of that situation. So all of the energy that would, would would have been used for other things, now is being used for something else. Does everybody get that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're constantly in that state, what do you think is gonna occur over time? Diseases. Yeah, diseases, right, exactly. Like, your body's gonna break down because what's being, you know, it, it's, the system is now just out of, completely out of and so many of us, unfortunately, don't suffer so much from that kind of like traumatic stress where we have to react react really quickly. I mean, some of us, you know, have been in situations where that's occurred and we've had to get out of them really quickly. But um, most of what's happening is we're stressed mentally. We're creating actually a lot of this, and then. What happens, we talked about this before, there's a perceived fear or danger. What did we, what have we said already about perceived fear or danger? It's not even present. And you're already perceiving the fear or the danger and therefore you're creating a situation as if it was happening. <laughs> so your body is responding as if it's happening. Your mind, that, like your, it doesn't know the difference, everybody. Like your body, your mind doesn't know the difference between like a very dangerous, traumatic situation. Like you know, somebody walks in here with like a gun or something like that, or like they're walking. Like you doesn't know the difference between that and perceived fear and danger that you're creating in your mind. So your body's going through the same reaction. That's crazy, actually. It's pretty amazing. 
So we have to take ourselves from that, from that sympathetic state into the parasympathetic state. So how do you drop yourself from the sympathetic state into the parasympathetic state? Well, it, it takes some work. That was part of the process this morning. And then going into the break, just being still and being quiet. Um, so that you can really be present to what's going on. So there's a gentleman, his name is Herbert Benson, and he is he was a Harvard professor, and he, he was the one that coined this phrase, relaxation response. Did Chrissy talk at all about relaxation response? We had that last night in there. Okay. Does anybody know what that is, what the relaxation response is? Okay, it's basically, what he said is that there is a way that you can affect your in the internal um, body, like your you know your heart, your um, you know the, the glandular body, the endocrine body, um, you know all of your organs. There is a way that you can affect them and induce the parasympathetic nervous system without mentally feeling relaxed. Like in other words, what, what he was saying is that you don't have to actually mentally feel calm and relaxed in that moment. But by doing activities to induce or create calmness or stillness can still have the same effect. So what he said was is that there, there are two things that need to be present in order for this to happen. First thing is, is that you have to have an intention of letting go. So you have to involve your mind a little bit, is that the mind has to hold within it the intention to let go of something, whatever it is. And then the second thing is that you do an activity that promotes repetitiveness so that you're able to have a certain level of uh, focus and concentration. So what are some repetitive exercise, uh, activities that one would do? Christy said like washing the dishes. Washing the dishes. Knitting. Sewing, knitting, running. This is why people get so actually, like, you know, a lot of people, why a lot of people like running? There's, there's a certain, you know, um, you know, part of that is that, as long as you're not listening to your headphones with music and all this other stuff, right? Walking, yoga, you know, breathing, pranayama. So it doesn't, it can be any activity in which you're doing something repetitively for a period of time with holding with holding the intention of letting go. And that that actually can, to a certain degree, create what he called a relaxation response, which is basically inducing your parasympathetic nervous system, getting you out of the sympathetic and into the parasympathetic. Okay? This is really important to everybody because um, most of our physical ailments that we have are due to this chronic state of stress that we're all in. A lot of it. It is the underlying cause of stress. There are lots of different stresses, but it's stress. There's some stress that's been put upon the body that has caused it to respond in such a way that an imbalance occurs. Right? Um, okay. So how is the how is the the practice doing the practice? Amazing. So what was what did what were you just noticing? How tired I was. Okay. How tired you are. Amazing, isn't it? You start to slow down, and then all of a sudden you're like, I'm exhausted. Like yeah. Like, yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it was hard to get up from some of those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Want to get How up. many of you go to bed before ten o'clock at night? Yeah, I'm so tired. <laughs> Not all the time, but at least okay. I do. No. All of you should be going to bed before ten o'clock at night. That sounds so nice. I know, but like the thing is, is that like your body, like after ten o'clock, and they've done lots of like research on this, is that you you just you don't get into those deeper levels of sleep after a certain hour. And especially if you're really <coughs> stimulating yourself before you go to bed, like eating, right? A lot of you, and this is another 
sort of chronic disease of New York City. You can have anything to eat until one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> All night. All night. Right. Right. Twenty-four hours. Yeah. Um, right. Twenty-four hours. Right. So you can, you know, most people that live in the city, they're eating dinner at eight o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. That's early. Right. <laughs> and that. Right. And that for some of you is early. And we have again lost touch with the natural rhythm. You know, so it's like, you know, this is, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago when there was like no electricity. People had to go to bed when it got dark. <laughs> I remember last um, year when we had the hurricane, you know, I lived downtown, I live in the West Village. So we were without everything for a week. It was awesome. <laughs> it was not fantastic that the hurricane happened. But what was, what was fantastic is that you really got to see how just shutting down like that for a period of time really is so important for the well-being of your whole self. And while all of my friends and all these people were panicking and go running to the Upper West Side, I stayed downtown in my apartment. Like, no way, it was awesome. There were no cars on the road. It was like, and I had, I happened to be really lucky because I lived in an old building, so I had gas and had a lot of hot water. <laughs> so I was like, what more do you need? Really, truly. I think I was in bed at like eight o'clock every night, you know, up, and it was just like, it was so awesome to just have that opportunity to just kind of get into a natural rhythm. Routine, having a routine for yourself is really important. You know, that's why, Children are giving routine. It's like, go to bed at this hour, you wake up at this hour, you have your breakfast at this hour, your lunch at this hour, and your dinner. But we just don't live that way anymore at all. Hardly. We've gotten so out of routine. And so that has created stress. Because one day we eat at 8 o'clock at night, and then the next day we eat at 10.30. Or then we eat at 6, or we eat at, we're all over the place. And also, unfortunately, our Western society has created this dynamic of, you know, workaholics, where you're just at work until seven, eight, doesn't matter, like whatever, you know what I mean? Whatever the boss demands of you to do, you're there. There's no more like nine to five job anymore, it doesn't exist. The nine to five job is like out the door, that doesn't exist anymore, unless there, is there anybody that you have that? Okay, all right, okay, that's good. Yeah, I was gonna say like medical clinics, things like that, you know, have maybe more of like a regular schedule, but your your typical corporate jobs or retail or you know, forget the restaurant business. You know what I mean? It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Plus the fact that like we always have to be accessible to our computers means that even if you do have a nine to five, if you're checking you're your so email awesome. till eleven thirty, it's like your brain never right. gets a break like right. it used to. But like, unless you're a surgeon that works in the emergency room that really has to be on call, <clears throat> what are you on call for? Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, unless you're, how many of you are surgeons? that work in the emergency room, that literally have to be on call. Okay, so then what are you on call for? That you have to check your emails until midnight, or go on Facebook, or whatever it is that you're doing, well, right? Or I mean, I know there's a few people, I think that yeah. you work with Asia, unfortunately, you're Okay, out. so you work with other countries that, yeah. yeah. Okay, then, right, then that, 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 makes it, that makes it hard. That makes your day yeah. different, okay, when you're working with other countries, yeah. And unfortunately, many of us don't have the courage or the strength to say, no, 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 sorry. That deal will have to close with somebody else. Do you know what I mean? And then you're like, no job tomorrow. Okay. So, you know, but like, it's just amazing what we have created for ourselves. It's 
unfortunate, actually, mm -hmm. that we've, cre we've created that. Like, we, there's so much impatience, so much impatience, you know? Um, and that impatience has given rise to chronic stress in our society. Um, so, if we choose to live in a city, and if we choose to be in jobs that require and demand certain things, then you people especially have to figure out how to get yourself a break and find space within that, you know, because sometimes it's just can't be helped, right? Sometimes it just can't be helped. It's like a mother that just has a newborn baby that gets two hours of sleep every night for like six months or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes there are certain situations for a period of time that just can't be helped where you're going to be exhausted and you're going to be, you're, you're putting out more than you're receiving. But that can't continue for too long because if it continues for too long, you will become sick, right? So it's okay if there's a period in your life that is, where you're working a lot, so like, you know, I have periods like that where I'm, you know, teaching a lot, I'm working a lot, and then I have periods where I take off, take off, you know? So it's just, it's necessary, everybody, to really um, consider that for yourselves. You know, and people really, they don't think of it in terms of how that, how that, that kind of ongoing stress is affecting them until one day they wake up and they're sick, really sick. They're like, how did that happen?
And in my first review, I remember my boss was like, Rachel, like, she really, I guess she really is very protective of her first of all time. It was like a thing in it. And you need a bigger sense of urgency with clients. And I never responded to that. Like, I kind of took it and I was like, okay. And I just kept doing what I was doing. And now it's just like, it's just what it is. And like, everyone just accepts it. And I don't send emails over the weekend, unless it's an emergency and something that really has to be dealt with. And so you created that. You just you yeah. you didn't buy. You didn't accept I that. Did. Okay, good. Yeah. And if, okay, that's a perfect example, everybody. That's, 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 that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome that you did that. But this that's awesome. That is a perfect example. Yeah. You do not have to be victim to somebody else's agenda. Mm -hmm. You really don't. You know what I mean? And you may think, well, oh, it's going to cost me my job. So what? That might not be the best environment of job for you to be in. And there are other good options. And I know you think, oh, you know, no, no, that's not true because the economy is blah, 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 blah. No, there's plenty of money in this country. And there are plenty, plenty of things for you to do. Plenty. You know? So um, it really, you really do have more control than you think. But because, Melissa, like you said, we, we've sort of, it, it's, it's almost like as a society, we've agreed upon this contract that this is how we're going to behave with each other. It's weird, actually. Like, it's like, we, we, it's like where's the contract and who signed it? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, that like, this, that like, this is, like, this is what it is. Like, because I'm sure when you got hired for that job, did they actually say, like, well, here's the thing, is that you need to respond to emails and phone time that, like, after, you know, from 5 to 12, and, like, especially if it's an urgent, like, you know, or there's a deal that's being closed. It's unspoken. Like, is that, it's unspoken. Right, okay, so then that means if it's unspoken, <laughs> it's unspoken. Yeah. It's not, it's not written, you all think you have this black and white contract that's requiring you to, uh, to, to, to behave in these ways that are just not helping you. Yeah. And it totally is societal. Yeah. Because if you look at other societies, there's not that. They don't function that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're upstream. Yeah. Siesta. You just need everyone. Plans change all the time. Electricity goes out, gas 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 goes out, gas
nothing happens in August. It's like vacation, it is like the whole month is like off, right? Some of you that are from other countries, you know this, right? And then also, like five o'clock, everything shuts down. You cannot get anything after five. <laughs> like done, people are having their little um, tea, their coffee, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. It's like life, you know, <coughs> work happens between these hours. Play and leisure happen between these hours. And rest happens between these hours. We, we have no more rest, and we have no more play and leisure. We're just all work, 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 work. We've lost, we've lost the play and the leisure. Like, when was the last time you just played? Yoga yesterday. As a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Yoga yesterday, okay, good, yeah. Okay, so that was like a playful practice, but it's, you know, like played games or like did a, played a sport or, or, or whatever it was, or just anything that really brings you pleasure. Because when you, have those things in your life that really bring you satisfaction and pleasure. They lower your stress level. Yes. It's important to laugh. It's important to play, to laugh, to have fun, to have to allow space and time for leisure because it lowers your stress level. But most of us walk around like this. You know? Like, have you ever really looked at the faces of New Yorkers? Like, you can tell when somebody's like European or like, you know, like a tourist or something, like yeah. healthy. <laughs> you know, and then you look at the people that like live in here, like, you know, and they're pushing and shoving and like, what, you know, it's like unbelievable, you know? Yeah. Um, I had a really hard time today. Yeah.
something to eat like around 6 o'clock or 6.30, like dinner or something, and there's nothing open. I was like, these people could not eat. I was like, what is going on? Like, I was so confused. And then all of a sudden, at like 8 o'clock at night, the restaurants opened. Weird, bizarre. By that time, I was like ready to go to sleep because I was tired because I was, I was teaching, I was working there. But, um, so, yeah, it's really fascinating. Each culture creates their own contract of how they're going to live and how they're going to be, you know, within that community or within that environment. And we've created the worst contract, I think. <laughs> like, we have the worst contract going, right? Definitely. And we don't get a lot in return, right? That's a, that is a bad investment. <laughs> like, yeah. for what you're putting out, you're not getting a whole lot back in your investment. So we have to learn how to have that balance what we're putting out and what we're receiving back. And if you're not getting that kind of balance from your work or whatever it is that you do, or, or your personal home environment, you know, you do, you, you're gonna have to figure out how to, how to satisfy that for yourself. It's really important. This is why relationships never work. Because we stop taking care of ourselves and so then, because we've stopped taking care of ourselves and we've, we've literally stopped valuing ourselves, then that just feeds into the, the, the chronic imbalance of our relationship. Right? We're putting out, putting out, putting out, and we're not, we're not actually invested enough in ourselves. And, you know, this is what yoga really talks a lot about is that before you can, and I think even Patanjali says that somewhere in the, in the yoga sutras, before you go out into the marketplace, he says, you have to have visited the internal market. Like you have to take care of yourself first. That value and worth of the self has to really be satisfied and fulfilled before you can have any balanced relationship. And I'm not just talking about intimate relationships, I'm talking about any and all relationships. Is it not very selfish to take care of yourself? No, no. Selfish, no. You don't do anybody any service by not taking care of yourself. You don't you do no one service by doing that. Because if you because if you don't take care of yourself, you you're of no value to anyone no, else actually. Sure. Because what what will happen is you'll end up being bitter resentful, angry, frustrated, and tired. That's a bad combination. You know, what if other people think that you're selfish? So what? Let them think that they're selfish. Teach them how to take care of themselves. It's very important, you know? It's really important. Like a mother can't properly take care of her child unless she herself is taken care of. Truly. How can you really truly care wholeheartedly in the full presence of another being when you haven't really done that for yourself? You've not done that for yourself. Who are you? You're just as valuable and as important as anybody else. We, we undervalue the preciousness of, of ourselves. You know? Um, it's not selfish, actually. It's selfless. Care for oneself is selfless because in the end, you're much more caring. You're much more available. You're much more present. When you're depleted, when you're tired, when you're angry, you're frustrated, you're run down, you don't have the energy to give anything to anybody else. Right? Especially like those of you that are in relationships and you have really, really stressful jobs and you come home and now you have to be with this other person that's there. And you're tired, and you're the, and the last thing that you want to do is be with that other person, <laughs> right? Because you're exhausted. You have no energy. So something's, you know, it's important to look at for yourself. So we, this has to become a huge part of our life, you know. 
ways in which we de-stress. And, and you know, physical asana practice that's, you know, um, you know, we've been doing really, really intense practices. And, and to a certain degree, those are very de-stressing in one way. But then there's this other component of actual real rest, like where you're really resting and really <coughs> relaxing and doing restorative yoga or whatever it is that is, is restful to you and for you. Like, how do you take care of yourself right now? Like, somebody share, like, some ways in which you self-care, take care of yourself. I try to wake up early and meditate before I go to work, and it really helps me to stay calmer during the day. Sometimes, actually, though, it does the opposite because I sacrifice sleep for it, and then it's like, now I'm even more tired, and <laughs> so, yeah, so sometimes it really helps, though. Okay, what else? Things. I have a gratitude list with a bunch of friends, so they just just write what we're gratitude for, grateful for. It. And then the other thing I do is uh, what well, helps. It's like <laughs> the other thing is um, sometimes I find myself in my head. So whenever I am like walking the office or walking, I have like a list of people that are favorites. And I just call them. So then I have a conversation with them about whatever they're if they pick up about whatever's going on in their life. Great. What other things do you do? What what physical things? Taking lunch with people and having to talk and just like how long have you been at this job? This job six months. Six months. Have you always done that? Pretty much. So what do they say to you? Like, where what do they? Been. What do they do? Like when you take that Sometimes time? I'll get a text message from my boss. Like, where? When are you coming back? Jeez, uh -huh. please. Or they like, I'll get an email from it. When you get back in, I need to talk to you about this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So. Here's the thing, this kind of this yeah. kind of bounces off really of what you were saying is that people aren't always gonna like what you do. When you get them, I know. Do you know what I mean? People are not always gonna like what you do. Who cares? Really, seriously, like who cares? You care too much what other people think. So like so they don't like you're taking an hour for lunch, but you are 
allowed to have an hour for yeah. lunch. Like legal, legally, you were allowed to take an hour for lunch. Like, you know, like, yeah. and that is just your son. You're allowed to do that. Your boss might not like it. People might not like it, but you're, you are free to, to do that. I feel like it kind right. of like regenerates me a little bit and I can yeah, come back great. and be way more productive. It's great. Day. I think a lot it's of tough. people, a lot of people could really benefit from doing that too. Like there's a lot of people that just don't take lunch or they have lunch at their desk or they, or you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know. I have some friends that have like really, you know, work on Wall Street, things like this, crazy jobs. Like I have a friend that runs a hedge fund company and stuff like that. And, um, Sometimes, like, she won't eat all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? She's like, well, I'm trying to lose weight. I'm like, that is the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> the wrong way to go about it. In order to lose weight, you have to eat food. <laughs> and then, like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, and so, like, it's just so interesting. And, like, so don't do that. <laughs> okay? Because that just puts more stress on your body. Because your body goes into, like, this starvation mm -hmm. mode. And then what ends up happening is you might end up eating more like later and probably not such good food because then you're starving and then you know what I mean? It's like it's yeah, so like not a great deal. But breakfast is important. Breakfast. So great. What else, Jen? Give your hand up. Oh no. I I have such a hard time with this conversation personally and I'm on the other side now. Like I, I'm not working twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. What do you do? I'm a train. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> my, yeah. And I, I think what I struggle with now when I talk to my friends, I'm here doing health screen on top of it, so I have close to a nine to six now. I do have to check my emails, but like to me, it's like I get out and I'm like, oh my gosh, like it's light out. Six o'clock. I can have dinner. Right. You know,
where I want to be. I'm going to take inventory now of what's, what changes I might be able to make to help myself a little bit more, create a little bit more space and balance. That's all. So it's not about speaking up and leaving, like not saying that at all. It's just understanding that most of us are in a chronic state of stress and how can we alleviate as much of that as possible. And and reducing or minimizing, just accepting, well, this is just the world we live in. Because we, you know what I mean? Because if we just, if we allow ourselves to just accept that, like, wholeheartedly to an extreme, we're just gonna keep going in this direction and then eventually this planet will no longer be here, we will no longer be here, like, you know, and, and that's what's happening. Because of the way that we're operating, we're off the planet, actually. So there has to, we've, we've gone too far, and so what I'm saying is just we have to backtrack a little bit and reassess how we're, what we're doing and how we're doing it. That's all. Yeah. I don't think we can all do our own part to yeah. help that. Of and course. We need to get over and more advanced on careers and work yeah. fostering and environments where people might work well. Yeah. You know, always like creating that space for people around you to sort of feel like it's okay to take a lunch or, you know, I remember I had a boss, the first time I had a boss that said, use every one of your vacation days. Like, I don't want to hear at the end of the year that you had any left. And I was like, that is a great mentor. Like, that's what we all should be striving for, to have that kind of role model in our lives to encourage us to go find that space. Yeah. So, doing that to people around you, your friends, and people that work for you, very rewarding. Yeah, and like, even like you said, Jen, like, you know, you have a conference call, like, at lunch, so you can't take a lunch, and, you know, listen, Obviously, there's compromises that we have to make in our lives, you know, in our relationships and in our work, like day to day. It's not, you know, it's not like you're just like, no, sorry, like, I'm not budging, you know what I mean, this way. It's not that. It's just being very observant where the imbalance is and just help yourself to just keep creating balance. Yeah, I didn't think that you were saying to just have a place. I think that's more when I think about it. Oh, when you think and I look back and I'm like trying to say to my friends, like, here are things that I've done that have made it better. I don't know that that path for me would have been sustainable. I had opportunities to stay. Mm -hmm. right. I, it was a pure, you know, right turn in my career that I absolutely wanted to take to leave. But I think that's more like, I'm, I'm so happy on the other side. I'm happy making those decisions. But if I made those types of decisions in that job, I'm not sure I would have. Right. Like, because once you caught you used to be once you crossed a line you could relax a little bit it's not like that and mm -hmm. less, of, less of an issue for me now like where I am yeah. but it's just the discussion I think is yeah. really interesting because I don't you know Chris isn't here today but I'm curious in his you know professional kind of practice and yeah. all of that like people live maybe they're not happy maybe it's not the most well that's the other that's the other side of it how, you know, how but that's the other side of it too is that like I think if you have a job like a really like high stress or high powered like job in some way and you love what you do that already is diminishing your stress okay so like I know people that work crazy hours and they love what they do and they are so even healed there's no stress so like I think there's that there's that fact like are you happy with what you're doing if you're really happy with what you do then you're already diminishing your stress level, like, so much. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are in jobs that they don't, they're not happy, and they're working 12 hours a day. And they're not having lunch, and they're not getting sleep, or whatever it is, you know what I mean? So that's kind of like more what I was talking about. Yeah, Heather, go ahead and then Mary. Um, I'm still on that other side, and doing the 10 o'clock and the 11 o'clock thing. Um, and I'm trying to figure out exactly when in the coming year I'm going to get out of it. So, are you a lawyer too? No, I'm not uh, financial services. Okay. So, um, between now and then, and this training is a, a small part of how I'm going to end. And I, I totally appreciate that yoga, teaching yoga, is not a path to. And we, we've all been a path to be a millionaire, definitely. Yeah. We, we, we're sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's like it, it 
money is really important to you and like you want to have lots of money and lots of things, jump on the other two. It's more this is my opportunity that to that do yesterday. something <laughs> that is a contribution to humanity. Anyway, in yes. the meantime, we still <laughs> have to survive. <laughs> and the little little things like after seven o'clock the lights go out every two hours. So um, maybe that's a signal that you should not only turn the lights on, but walk two laps around the floor just to get out of your seat. Yeah. And maybe the coffee machine takes longer than you would wish to dispense the coffee. And maybe that's a <laughs> signal that you should think about your mantra or, or you know, your, your gratification list. Um, and, and so on. Maybe um, you have to get a snack after five in order to get by. Maybe you want to walk three blocks to get it, just to get some air through the brains. And <laughs> these are very, very small things that I do. I'm interested in if you would um, help us with what time of day, I thought it was early morning, is meditation meant to be most beneficial? About four, about four or five o'clock in the morning. Okay. <laughs> um, and but none of you are leading that lifestyle, and which is like totally fine. And it doesn't matter. You don't have, you're, this is not about becoming a monk. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or becoming like a Buddha. Like this is not like, you know, you are all doing whatever you do in your lives because that's what you want to do, right? And it's, it's, it's perfect and it's great. I happen to be incredibly fortunate, and I know a lot. You know, I'm sure Alyssa too, but I, I started, you know, I, she doesn't even know what I'm talking about. I, I, I started teaching 18 years ago. I started teaching 18 years ago. And because I started teaching 18 years ago, I'm very fortunate to this day to be able to work full time as a yoga teacher and live in New York City and fully sustain myself and travel and go away and do all those things. I'm very fortunate. I'm a, it's a rare thing, okay? Nowadays, it's a little bit harder to create that because there's just, it's just, there's just more. So, you know, this might not be a full-time thing that a lot of you do. Maybe this is just something that you do part-time or on, you know, and you, and you sustain your financial income in another way, you know? Um, but I'm not saying that it's not possible to, to do what I do or what Elizabeth does or what you know, but how long have you been teaching? Uh, 14. 14 years, right, okay, so. I never had a real job. Never had a real job, not even that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I never, I never worked like behind a desk and I don't ever plan to. But that was just my, you know, my experience in my life. But it was also an opportune time for that to happen. That's all. It is still possible for you to create that and do that. It's just a little bit more challenging now than it was. That's all. What were you going to say? Oh, I think it's also, too, just about keeping one skill and finding that balance because not only did it just work, you know, I have a child in the fifth grade in New York City public schools. There are two to three fundraisers every month. Yeah. I mean, there are neurotic mothers emailing me at all hours of the night. You know, being, 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 volunteer. You have to just pick and choose what you're going to do. And that's John Rutrosen, who has raised like billions and billions of dollars for charitable organizations, said only give as much as feels good. 
<laughs> and like once it stops feeling good, you shouldn't be giving anymore because it's not yeah. functional. Yeah, and it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable to constantly be giving. It's not sustainable. You will deplete your reserve. It's just not, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, just think about it. If you only had a certain amount of money in the bank and every day you gave like a dollar, at a certain point, you no longer have any money in the bank. You have to keep replenishing what, what is there. This is what I'm talking about in terms of yourself. You have to keep replenishing your own reserve, your own self, so that you can keep giving whatever it is that you get and that you do. Okay, yeah. And then on top of that, 
you could add some of these restorative asanas at the end of your class, at the beginning of class. It's just, this, that's what this is for, okay? Not to teach a full restorative class, but just to add some restorative poses into your sequence. Yeah? Question about Shavasana. Yeah. I think you were talking about it before, and someone mentioned that Shavasana is start after 20 minutes. After 20 minutes? Yeah. Did you say that? I don't know. Who said that? Chrissy. Chrissy? Carter? Chrissy. Chrissy. Like Possible. I mean, so I think scientifically they you know, really discovered that in order for the nervous system and all different levels of the body to really relax, you know, it's like when you go to sleep at night, how long does it actually take the body to go into that very deep state of sleep, you know? I don't know what the time is, but, so you know. So, for example, um, to give a fresh reference to someone, how long is the Shavasana? If you're private. If, yeah, if you're not limited in time. If you're not limited in time, give them as much as you can. Like, you know? I mean, I mean 20 minutes is a lot. 20 minutes is a lot. Like, that's a lot for somebody to do on a regular basis. Like, I mean, if you're a teacher teaching a private or you're where you're teaching. It also just depends on what does the person need. If the person really needs to like de-stress and chill out, and then I say, yeah, do 20 minutes of Shavasana with them. But if, um, you know, <laughs> no one's gonna do 20 minutes. That's really hard to do 20 minutes of Shavasana. I would say the most, <laughs> it's true. Can you imagine sitting there and someone's I know, I That'd be great. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So like, you, like for example, you see down at the bottom there, Janu Shirshasana, 
You've only been taught Tani Shashasana one, you've not been taught Tani Shashasana restoratively, your thoughts. We haven't done that with you. So like, um, just know that this is probably a bit, I mean, most Iyengar classes are two hours, also just keep that in mind. So knowing that this is probably fine for a two hour restorative class, mm -hmm. but anything less than that, this would be too much. Um, it's also really important, so you see they have headstand in there too. And you might be thinking to yourself, like, how and why? How is headstand in any remote way restorative? <laughs> so, what do you think? Like, how, how would that be restorative, headstand? Blood pressure? Well, it's restorative, like, well, first of all, when you are actually, you know, strong enough to do headstand, like, or even something you've been practicing for a while, it does become restorative. As well as shoulder stand, you know. But in the beginning, when you're first learning and you're not strong enough or flexible enough to do these inversions, it's it, it's not relaxing at all. <laughs> um, so part of it is the, the the pressure, right, on the head. But also um, there are ways that you can do these with a lot of support. Head stand. So you can do actually variations of shirshasana. They just have shirshasana. There's Shashasana 1, which is this headstand, and Shashasana 2, which is the tripod headstand. But there's numerous ways that you can do headstand supported on chairs, supported with blocks, where your head is actually not on the floor. You did it here. You did it here with the three. Four yeah. blocks on each side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, in Iyengar, they have you know ropes on the walls, where oftentimes you'll hang from the ropes upside down. So you get you, so you get the benefit of, of hanging upside down and being upside down without the necessarily the weight um, on the head. Um, so it's important for you to know basically that restorative yoga does not mean lying down and taking a nap all the time. Like it's not just about it's not just about doing supine or prone poses. But you can actually do things in a restorative fashion that are, you know, things like inversions or standing poses and these sorts of things. Okay, do we have any questions about that? But I wouldn't take this restorative sequence here and then go and try to do it because, again, you don't know what kind of props are, are being used for this sequence. Like, just take the ones that are like the most basic, simple ones for today that you have that, that are in here and that we've given you the setups for and then You'll eventually add to that, you know, as you um, as you go. Um, okay. So if you go back to your Asana manual, um, I love on page twenty two nineteen here it says additional techniques for managing stress. Regular exercise. That's the top there. Regular exercise. Positive attitude. Right? Do your best and let go. So there you go, Mary. Do your best and let go. That's, that is helpful in managing stress in terms of around guilt, right? We feel like, I don't do enough, I don't give enough. Do your best and let go. Right? Um, Time spent with family, friends, and animals, you know, <coughs> animals are amazing. How many of you have animals? Oh, they're so great. I have a little Yorkie. Aww. Her name is Shushu. <laughs> <laughs> Can you bring her? I can bring her. Can I bring her? What did she say? <laughs> My partner is a friend. Okay, so like that's what that name came from. What does it mean? Shushu. My um, my little or my precious. Oh. Yeah. Oh. She's so cute. She's ten. She's like this big. Bring her. Yeah. Huh? Bring her. I know. I should bring her. <laughs> um, animal babies should be on that list. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know.
that's should be on there on that list as well. But these are just like additional things, okay? So you've got your, um, if you flip over page 220, overview of restorative poses, um, basic alignment principles, which is really important, you know, the eyes, throat, abdomen, and neck are relaxed, okay? The whole point is to get the system, the body, to be relaxed. So however you're going to support the body in these poses, it needs to be in such a way that the body can just be forgotten. Um, I do not What's that? What does that mean? Uh, in other words, like, you want to make sure that the props that you're using are offering an adequate support in which all systems of your body can completely relax. Everything. Because I was asking myself while you were in that um, seated forward pole, should I be pressing into my heels or no. one chicken asana, should I pull up my uh, eyes? Yeah. No, in mo yeah, so mostly in, in the restorative poses, it's not about doing any work, actually. It's really just about letting go. So it's, you know, so if you feel like you're having to do any work, then you're probably not supported enough in the position, because if you need to change it a little bit. But that, what we were doing at the beginning with the chairs was a little bit different. Oh. Okay, so that was not, that was not really a restorative practice per se. I just wanted to do a little series with some things in a chair to give you that experience. And also those of you that are going to be teaching privately, they have a little bit sort of more in the rep repertoire in terms of like, especially if you work with people that are older or not able to get on the floor and do certain things and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You said earlier as we started our practice that many of your clients just need to understand how to get up off the floor. Mm -hmm. could, could you, when, when the time is right, give us uh, a few pointers on that? How to get up and down off the floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, part of, it, part of it is just increasing their flexibility and um, strengthening their balance through certain, through certain movements. And then it becomes more approachable and more accessible to get up and down off the floor. Do they use props in the meantime? Yes, I use a lot of props with them. Okay. A lot of props, wall, chairs, all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so they have support, supported body tenacity here. We did it with most most of the time. You're going to be putting blocks under the knees. I just want you to just make a note of that on, on that page there, supported body tenacity. Blocks under the knees, and also we had a belt that we used. Okay. Um, how was that pose for you? Amazing. Yeah. That's a pretty, pretty standard restorative pose that's pretty accessible to most people and easy enough to do. So. The blocks are, we're not really trying to get that stretch like we typically no. do. No, no. In the restorative poses, everybody, you're not trying to do anything. <laughs> you're not trying to do anything. It's really just about relaxing and letting go. So that's why you're offering optimal support to the body so that it can do that. Um, so you're not trying to, it's not about trying to stretch, open your hips or any of that. Kind of stuff. It's really just about relaxing and letting go. Yeah. So when we do feel a stretch, we need more support? Sometimes you might. I mean, it's not, it's not to say that you won't feel the stretch. Um, you might, and some of you actually might feel more sensations happening when you're in those positions, kind of holding them. Um, but the goal is not to, to, to try to do that. The try, if that happens naturally as a result, then that's fine. Does that make sense? And I think we know, it was like when we were, we had our back over the one, uh -huh. so if you need support for your little Yes. Like, I knew it was not comfortable. Right. It didn't so yeah, for some of you, like, and sometimes the bolsters, you know, the bolsters are so thick and big. Sometimes when you lie over those, it really puts a big over curvature to your back. For, for some of you, that would be too much. And so if you just sit up a little bit onto a couple of blankets, it reduces that for you um, a little bit. And then you have V3D crying, which we've done already, legs up the wall. It can be done with a bolster or it can be done with um, blankets. And also, again, just to really make note for yourself, <laughs> the sit bones are hanging off, right? 
um, of that. So it's, it's the lower back and the sacrum that's supported, but your tailbone and your sit bones are sort of hanging off the edge. And then on page um, 225, um, you have supported Setjivanda Sarvangasana. There are actually numerous variations of supported um, bridge pose. This is one, and this is the one that I did with you today, just because we, it's in your manual, so I wanted to do that with you. So we took those two blankets, like light, light wide, uh, vertically on your mat, and you lie back and belted your arms up, felt good. Yeah, I love that one. Um, and this picture they're showing with the arms like that, which is also fine, which is down by your side, okay? Um, and it's not showing with the belt. I think the belt is nice, because what it does is it just, it keeps everything just kind of in the center, and it just allows your sacrum and your back to release a little bit more, as opposed to just letting your legs splay apart. Um, and then lastly, you have Shavasana there, without any props. So I want you to flip over one more page. On page 229, you'll see lots of different Shavasana variations. You see that? So what are some Shavasana variations that you've done in classes No, that's not Shavasana. That's be pretty funny. Your legs are up the wall, that's something else. But like Shavasana, like so bolster under like, your legs or blankets under your legs. What other variations of Shavasana under your face? Like a like a blanket or an eye cover. Yeah, so we were talking about that too. It's really nice to have to kind of black out the, you know, um, that would just be adding something, not necessarily like a variation, but what else? I did a little bit of a variation with you at the end, uh, at the end of the chair series, putting the legs up onto a chair. Okay. So that would be very similar to putting a leg on a bolster or on a blanket, but just a little bit higher. Um, what about things under your knees, like uh, with your legs, like your knees on blocks, like that, just open? No, no, just like anything with the legs. Anything like straight. Okay. Straight out, yeah. It. What else? Like blanket under the chest. <laughs> Blanket a little bit under the chest, yeah, or blanket at the top of the body, yeah. Um, that's really nice, like, so why and when would you do these different variations? Like, when would it be, when, when would it be a good um, variation to do the, like, bolster or blankets underneath the legs? Like after breakfast. Yeah. After a lot of, okay, people that have lower back, like that it's difficult for them to lie down with that, with not being able to relax their lower back, but if you did a big back bending class or series, after a lot of back bending, it's nice to support under the legs a little bit, okay? If you've done a lot of um, standing poses or uh, things like, um, like that, it's nice to weight the body a little bit, or also maybe elevate the leg a little bit more, like on a chair or something like that. I would say if you do a really heavy standing pose practice, what I would do is like three minutes of you pretty crying with the legs up the wall, and then my job is Shavasana. Because if you do a lot on your legs, like in a class, it's nice to <coughs> invert the legs, like especially if you, if, if you didn't do an inversion, like it's good to invert the legs. <coughs> No, not really, because there's not it's not a total inversion. Yeah. Um, so here are some just some other examples. There's a prone example down at the bottom lying on the on the abdomen. Pressure then widens the lower back muscles. This shavasana is very soothing for anxiety. Interesting. As the front body is protected. Yeah, it's not as exposed. Yeah, so so for somebody that's very anxious and has a lot of anxiety, it might be nice to have to use that kind of prone position with them in shavasana as opposed to being so open and exposed in that way. Um, 
Okay, and then flip over and you'll see a couple of others. Um, I also remember right after September 11th, um, Mr. Iyengar sort of sent out this um, message to a lot of the teachers and he said, you know, because of the um, post-traumatic stress that a lot of people were feeling after September 11th, to not practice Shavasana with the eyes closed, to actually practice with the eyes open. And, um, and just to, to have like a soft gaze at something. And even in practicing meditation to do that, that it was actually more calming for people to have their eyes open, that we're dealing with like a lot of anxiety and post-traumatic stress. So I thought that was very interesting actually, yeah. Um, my yoga teacher, he teaches deep rel relaxation techniques with Savasana, um, and it's like eight minutes long, and he kind of brings you through this like deep, like inward process. But anyone who has any kind of um, any form of depression, whether it's severe or not severe, are, he like strongly advises them to not do it. And he actually had um, a client who he would come to their, would come to his house and had some type of um, depression, and brought him to a deep relaxation technique, and they took him to the hospital. So he like freaked out. Yeah. It, so it's, I mean, it's like, yeah. a, it's like a no joke. You know, yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's really good to know what people are dealing with, you know, when you're, and, and this is the unfortunate thing about teaching a large group of people because you don't actually know what's going on with people. You don't, you don't have any sense of really what's, what's going on with people unless you ask, unless you talk to them, you have like a, a, a relationship with them or, um, you're teaching them privately. Those are good things to know, you know? Um, so, so these are just some other examples. You see this feet on the chair, feet on, um, feet up against the wall. So that's like a little bit more kind of grounding as well. Also, um, sandbags are really nice too to use. Like, you know, putting sandbags on the legs or sandbags on the hands. Like if any of you have ever had that done before, we unfortunately don't have ton of them at the studio, so we don't use them like a lot, but they're really great to use. Um, they get used in on anywhere you go a lot. Sandbags on the legs or? Sandbags on the legs, like when you like, like here, or sandbags like on your hands. Like it's just like a really, and we can put them on the shoulder, yeah. As long as it doesn't feel too like congested on the chest, but like it's so nice to just have that weight. Um, and sometimes when I've had access to uh, um, sandbags, it's really nice and be pretty crummy because you're like at the wall, put sandbags on your feet and just like the weight of the legs just really release into the, into the hip. Also, um, like in child's pose, and like putting weight on the sacrum, like in a forward bend, is really nice. It's like an adjustment, right? It's like an adjustment. <laughs> Well, it's like the yeah, it's like the weight aspect really helps the body to release and relax a little bit more, more deeply. Okay. Um, all right, and then just really quickly, just flip over to page two thirty four. This is a um, this is sort of like they're giving you this little um, sequence here um, for. Women that are on their menstrual cycle. This is a good. This is a good sequence for <laughs> going with the flow. Yes, that's it. <laughs> but you know what? It's like this is another chronic problem in the, our society. Is so many women have menstrual problems, fertility and menstrual problems. You know, stress. So like this is also a really this is this is just a good practice for women on their cycle. If you, if you practice like anger yoga, um, also ashtanga yoga, like there's some methods of practice where you don't practice in your period at all, nothing, because it's like you're sort of defeating the purpose of what's happening physically and physiologically. You know, when you when you because you should actually not be increasing your activity, but slowing down your activity at that point. Okay. Um, because that's the, the natural thing that's occurring in your body. It's like when you're, you're, 
when you're um, on your menstrual cycle, it's like, first of all, your blood pressure is increasing. And also the blood is actually, you know, everything is moving down and out. And so by increasing your level of activity, you actually stop and, and, and prohibit that process a little bit. And especially women that have any kind of, you know, menstrual, like, you know, endometrial problems, endometriosis, like, you know, or any kind of problem with their cycle should really take care to not be too hyperactive during that time and use that as an opportunity to do a restorative practice. Like, there's your out women. <laughs> Once a month for three to four days doing restorative yoga during that time you have your period. Like, why not? It can't hurt, it can only help, you know? Um, so, it's, you know, it's a good thing to think about. Yes? It's funny to hear that. I don't know if anyone else experienced this, like when they were in grade school, but people trying to get out of gym class, like, oh, I'm so good up here. <laughs> and the gym teacher always would say, oh, well, this will help you. Physical uh, activity will help you. Yeah. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm not I'm talking about like you're not doing like ten sun sites, you're not doing yeah. kickboxing yeah. or like running five miles, like yeah, some light activity yeah. is fine. And like a lot of these positions are very like open it's like where you're opening like all of them are like that. Like the down yeah. it's like below and just up yeah. all positions. And then the forward bending is just pacifying the you know, the kidneys. Um, okay, so any questions with the restorative kind of um, idea? So this is not to teach a restorative class, this is just to add some restorative poses into your sequence to give you that kind of information. If you wanted to teach restorative, you'd have to do a full training. And if you want to experience a full restorative class and you haven't, go and do a restorative class. Yeah. I went to a restorative class where the teacher was talking about colors, and I don't know if you're familiar with this. Or with this but she had you thinking about a color, and the color was going through your body, and it was so long ago, I don't remember the details. And she would have it, you know, somehow enter one side of your body and maybe go through, if not the other, or just focus in your head for a while, the color blue. Was it the chakras? Was she using like the chakra system? That might have been. So the form of running. Okay, that might have been it. Well, next weekend actually you're gonna learn about that. Okay. Next next weekend you're gonna have all of your specialty topics. Next weekend's gonna be a really nice weekend for you because it's not about collecting a lot of none of that stuff that you're gonna it, it, you're gonna be tested on next weekend. You're gonna have a lecture on Ayurveda, the subtle body. Um, Subtle energetic body, which includes the chakra system, um, and then prenatal yoga. So those three things. So Jean Marie and I will not be here next weekend. I know. Because there's other teachers coming in to teach you. But it would be kind of nice because you get to.